Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. We've been going through uh, several different scrolls and a few of you have asked a little bit about 11Q13. Uh, it's a very, very good scroll to witness with. And there's, again, just to give you a little bit of background, we're going to look at that tonight. But talking about the Essenes in general, if you pull all the scrolls together, they paint a very interesting story. So in, in seminary, I was told the Jews didn't know a whole lot about things until Messiah came and explained things, and now we know a lot more. Well, according to the scrolls, they knew just about everything. There was a, um, a cult that rose up, Sadducees and Pharisees, to make a long story short, they, they called them the, a cult, the sons of darkness versus the sons of light. And they changed the story. Uh, Messiah wasn't God incarnate. He was just a general to win a war. Messiah wasn't supposed to be God incarnate. He's just a person. Uh, Messiah is supposed to be sometime, not in 32 AD. Uh, they said the Messiah comes to die for our sins, to reconcile us to God. And they understood the prophecies very well. They had commentaries on the minor and major prophets which agree with a lot of things that Paul said about the major and minor prophets. So basically, in a nutshell, they were Trinitarian. They were Messianic, much like a Messianic Jew today, if you go to a Messianic synagogue. Same basic idea. Now, you might say that's an in-house debate, and who knows for sure. But the thing is, as a Christian, we follow the New Testament. And the New Testament is very clear in its wording. It's There is a trinity. The Messiah is God incarnate. He died for our sins, died on the cross uh, to pay the penalty for our sin nature, started the age of grace. That's Acts chapter 2 and all the other things that Paul talks about. Uh, so if you believe in the New Testament because you're a Christian and you go back and you look at the Sadducees, Pharisees, uh, scribes, they all differ in doctrine. Essenes do not. And so that's what's really interesting. And the interesting thing about it is a Jew is taught ignore Christians because there are Christian denominations that would uh, not like Jews at all. Um, and Zionist Christians are not, of course. So there's different kinds of Christians. And then there's Christian cults, just like there's Jewish cults, Muslim cults. You know, and a cult is someone that basically just says, I am this religion, whatever religion that is. But they teach something so different than what that religion teaches. And it's all based on that. The, the Muslims go by the Quran, Christians go by the Bible, etc. Uh, so if you claim to be one of these and don't follow it, you're not one of them. We have a lot of people in politics that say, I'm, I'm a hardcore, very devout Roman Catholic, but I believe in abortion. Not possible. You can believe in abortion. You can be a Catholic, but you can't be one in the same. It, the, the doctrines are very specific. And we have a lot of stuff like that as, as an example. But so let's look at this because the interesting part is the fact that if you're Jewish and you reject those people that want to kill you from different religions, and uh, you're, you're just going to follow the Tal Talmudic interpretation, what the rabbis say, the Talmud was put together in the 200s AD, 2 to 300. So these writings are 2 to 300 BC, or 1 to 200 BC. A couple of them are, are older than that, but most are around 100 BC or so. So these are from your ancestors, your great, great, great grandfathers, for instance. And they tell you, this is the story. Some occult came along and changed the story. Don't listen to anybody that says this. You've been lied to. Follow directions from your ancestors and wait for Messiah. And that's pretty straightforward. And since this predates the rabbis, that's something that you've really got to ask yourself a question. Do I believe what my pastor said, my rabbi said, my this tradition? Or do I go way, way back and look at what my great ancestors taught? And if there's a difference, there's a problem. We have the same phenomenon in Roman Catholic society today. They say, well, whatever the Pope says is what goes. And of course, Protestants would disagree with that. But assuming that's correct, that the Pope has the ability to, to change things, 
if you look at a first century pope like uh, clement or any of those guys and they say things like in clement of rome for instance said we're saved by grace through faith alone without works so if you have a, a pope today saying the opposite there's a problem if the first century church said mary was taken care of by john died and is buried in ephesus and you have a pope from 1956 forward saying mary never died well, the Lord can do miracles. Maybe Mary never died, but she couldn't have died and not died at the same time. There's a problem somewhere. And so this idea that popes are infallible, somebody's not somewhere because there's a problem. Uh, so the rabbis might be infallible. Well, somebody's not because there's a problem. Um, so same thing. If I went to a charismatic church or a baptist church or a you know catholic church or whatever and i taught something different there's a problem and so that's what you want to look at you want to look at the old testament and look at the stuff that you've been taught look at what your ancestors taught and then make a decision and if you realize what we're going to see tonight is just one scroll out of 900 scrolls and many of them talk about messiah being god incarnate and coming at a certain time and how to tell who messiah is and this kind of stuff we'll go back and look at the testaments sometime hopefully this summer and look at things so let's get to our study so here is um the 11 q 13 and what this means the 11 q 13 part is that in qumran uh, or in that area of qumran there were 53 caves that were found most of which have nothing in them. They've went through with a fine tooth comb. There's actually hundreds of caves and they've went through with archeology span teams, people that are biased and non-biased, professionals that won't mess anything up, accidentally step on anything. They know what they're doing and they all together bring these scrolls out so nobody can have tampered with them, for instance. So these people go through and out of the 53 caves, so far, 12 of them have been discovered to have some sort of writing artifact, uh, writing on pottery or on paper or something like that. So this particular one is the 11th cave it's out of the 12. So it's the 11th cave in Qumran. That's the 11 in the Q. And then the 13 is simply the 13th scroll found in cave 11 of Qumran. So 11Q13. It's also called 11 q Melchizedek because of the, the text. Okay, so let's skip toward the end because I want to show you one specific thing that it mentions and then we'll come back and slowly go through the entire thing. It's not very big, as you can see. It's about that long. So I've got two pages, two and a half pages, basically. But in here, we have a place where it says... Um, Okay, that's column two. Let me get down here. It should be right here. Okay, so this part right here. I'm just going to read this last part. He's talking, and through these things, what's going to happen is they're going to say there's a scripture. Moses said this, or someone said this, and then they'll quote the scripture, and they're going to say that this is a, a prophecy about Messiah or Israel or something. And here's our interpretation. Now, their interpretation may or may not be correct, but that's their theology, and that's what we would do. We would take a look at it. If this is written 200 B.C., and they say a certain date, a certain event would happen, and it actually took place, and we know this to be beforehand, that's an accurate prophecy, no matter who said it or anything about it. But this is what it's saying. They're talking about a passage that is saying uh, about god reigning in zion so the question is if this is interpreting prophecy what is zion who is god uh what are the people what's the situation how do you interpret it so it says um the zion is those who uphold the covenant these uh those who do not turn or that turn aside from walking in the ways of the people so what they're going to be saying is that the ancient prophets moses and aaron and on down they all gave prophecies they all gave information on how to do things what to do what not to do 
and people decide they want to do their own thing. They go out and sin, and then because they've sinned, they don't really want to go to church or, or synagogue or something like that, so they just stay away from it. And eventually people forget all of it together, and they don't know anything about God. So in this case, they're saying in this prophecy, Zion represents those people who uphold the covenant. Not the old covenant or the new covenant, because in a sense, it's the same thing. It's belief in Messiah. There's differences in the covenants, but still. So the people, they follow directions. They don't turn aside and walk in the ways of the people. Today, I would say, are you a Christian? Do you go to church? Do you study prophecy? Do you want to get closer to God? Or are you content to go out in the world and do whatever? And that's what we're talking about. So these are dedicated believers, in other words. Okay. And then for them, it says, your God is Melchizedek. So we're going to be talking here about there's an Aaronic priest or a Levitical priest. And there was a guy named Levi. There is a Melchizedek, which can be a person's name. It's also the name of a priesthood. So I, in my writings, I'll usually say Melchizedekian priest or Levitical priest. So we don't get confused. I'm not talking about that guy, Levi, or that guy, Aaron. But in this case, there is a Melchizedekian priest or a priest referred to as Melchizedek. And he is your God. And that's something you wouldn't say other than the fact this is a Christophany. And your God, Melchizedek, will save you from the hand of Belial. Belial is a, another word for Satan. Uh, so, and it goes on and talks about other things. But I wanted you to know this in this case. And you might look at this and say, well, that looks like what it says, but it's kind of iffy, just one little point. There are probably 10 to 20 different quotes throughout the scrolls that are very, very clear that they believe that Messiah would be God incarnate. So they talk about Hashem, you know, the what we would call the Father, and there's Messiah when he comes, however he comes, we have no clue, but it's just, there's the Father, there's the Messiah, and then there's the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and we know him well because we're prophets and he speaks to us. So they talk about things like that. So they don't come out and say we're Trinitarian. That term was invented about 160 a.d by a church father but the concept is taught there's one god there's only one god and he manifests as 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 father messiah and holy spirit there's even one text that talks about the uh, shema which is they mention in, in in a lot of jewish circles hero israel the lord your god the lord is one but the whole concept is one god it manifests in three persons not three gods but that's another subject, but this is, we're talking about the Messiah. In other words, I want you to see that. So the Messiah is Melchizedek, and he's God incarnate somehow. Okay, so with that, let's go in. We're missing column one. And like most of these scrolls, we're missing column one. We've got almost all of column two, which is good. And then a few little pieces of column three. And you'll see in a minute why, but I really, really want to get my hands on a full copy of column three. It has to do with prophecy in our time period. And I have a sneaking suspicion I'm not going to get that one. We'll see why here in a minute. But this says, Moses said, and then they quote Leviticus 25. Now, the Leviticus 25, 13, I put here in brackets. And anything in brackets is just me trying to explain the text. So they quote the text properly. And I'm just letting you know where that's at. So Moses said, in the year of Jubilee, each of you shall be freed to return home. And then he described how, saying, this is the manner of the release. Let every creditor, and the word for creditor there is, is actually bail. It's a lord or somebody you serve. And you're always enslaved to someone whom you owe money to. So that's the concept. But let every creditor remit what he has lent his neighbor. He shall not press his neighbor for or his brother for repayment, for it is the Lord's release has been proclaimed. And that's a quote from Deuteronomy 15. So we're talking about a time, there's a, the, a seven-year period when Jews forgive debts one to another. There's a 50-year period when debts are forgiven to Gentiles. And so it's really interesting. The concept is 
you have this in slavery, this uh, inflation and things like that. And how you keep check on it is after so many years, all debts are forgiven, period. And you start over. You own the home. You didn't finish paying for it, but it's done. You own your home now. Congratulations. And so everybody knows that and they're not going to try to sell you a house for $50 billion because they're never going to get paid. It's just a way to keep everything uh, under check. But they're going to say that this has a prophetic meaning. And let, let me stop there for a minute and give you another example. Most of us remember the law about the, um, the um, cities of refuge. Okay, so if I was to murder somebody, they will come and find me and execute me. But if I accidentally killed somebody, I go to a city of refuge. And they say, if, if they, there's a trial and they agree, yeah, you didn't really mean to do it. It was an accident, manslaughter. But I have to stay in a city of refuge. I can't leave that city. And if the relatives of the person that died find me outside of the city of refuge, they have a right to kill me because I did cause a death. And so I have to remain there in that city until the high priest that was high priest at the time I committed the offense dies. Then I get to go free. And we look at that and we think that sounds kind of funny. And it is at first, if you think about it, if, if you committed a crime and you've been waiting for 20 years and I committed, a, well, the accidental death and I committed one yesterday and today the high priest dies, we both go free. And it doesn't seem logical. So there's got to be something behind it. Uh, some sort of prophecy or it must mean something. And of course, I think you and I can figure out what that means. We're trapped in sin. My sin might be worse or less than yours. It doesn't really matter. All sin condemns to death, right? And the only way we get out of this is by the death of the Messiah, our high priest. So Adam has been waiting, for instance, for 4,000 years almost when Jesus came and paid the penalty on the cross. You and I don't have to wait at all. We say, forgive us, you're forgiven. And then now if we die, we're right there with the Father, where Adam had to wait 4,000 years to be able to be back in good God's grace. So it's an interesting thing to look at. These things are pictures of what Messiah would do, and sometimes prophecies. So in this case, he's talking about the year of Jubilee, when all debts are forgiven. And this is the manner of how it works, okay? And it says, this is the interpretation of that. It actually has a meaning. Its interpretation pertains to the end of days. Now, that term end of days actually means an end of an age. So they could be thinking the end of their age, which is a first coming thing. Messiah is going to come, fix our sin nature, start the age of grace. There's going to be all sorts of cool stuff. We're looking forward to the Messiah's first coming. Right now, you and I are looking at the end, uh, toward the end of our age. We're looking for the rapture, that seven-year period, the second coming of Jesus Christ. When the millennial reign begins, oh man, that's going to be so much better than it is now. You know, but still, that's not the end. There's another thousand years, and then there's an end. So the end of days is not the one time when the whole planet gets destroyed or anything like that. Uh, it's the end of a time period, which always occurs with an advent of the Messiah. So, so this is the interpretation. It pretends to one of the advents of the Messiah. And, and they mention the fact that it's one Messiah with two comings, not two Messiahs. So again, very interesting in the text. So the captives that Moses speaks of in this passage about the people that are indebted, that need their debts forgiven, you know, so they don't have to pay the money anymore. These captives that Moses is speaking of are actually the same people that Isaiah speaks of. And it says here, this is a quote when Isaiah says, to proclaim freedom to the captives. I want to stop here. I forgot to open this up, but I want to open up my e-sword and I, I want to show you something. This is um, in the New Testament in Luke chapter four. We have, and it'd help if I went to a regular version here, bump this up, but Jesus is in the wilderness, tempted, 
starts his ministry, and then he goes to Nazareth. And remember, he proclaims himself to be Messiah, and they basically throw him out, right? And there's a couple miracles that happen. So this says, talking about Jesus, he came to Nazareth, and when he had brought up and was the custom, as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered to him of the book by the prophet Isaiah. Okay. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is Isaiah 61. And so he finds this and he actually reads this out loud that day in the synagogue. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are abused, and to teach the acceptable year of the Lord. And of course, it's we note a lot of times that this is that's right in the middle of a sentence. The other part of the sentence is, and the year of vengeance, which has not come yet or in their time doesn't come for another 40 some years. So he stops right then. So just this part is what he reads and he stops and it says he closed the book, gave it again to the minister and sat down. All eyes were upon them. All the, all the eyes of all of them, of course, were on there, were fastened to him. So they're all look, waiting for Jesus to say something. And then he says one of the most powerful things ever. He says this to them, this day, like today, this scripture is fulfilled. This prophecy is fulfilled right now. It was fulfilled when you heard me say it. It is now done. And of course, they recognize that that's only possible if Messiah was here and the incidents start happening. But he's quoting this. So Jesus quotes Isaiah. So this is obviously talking about the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is upon me. The Messiah is actually saying this. And this is Isaiah quoting what Messiah would say. And he's supposed to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, deliver the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So with that, they're saying here that the interpretation of uh, forgiving of your debts on Jubilee in the Jubilee year. Its interpretation pertains to the end of the days when the Messiah will be here the first time. The captives Moses speaks of is those same people whom Isaiah says to proclaim freedom to the captives. So he's saying that is a prophecy in Isaiah. It's talking about the same thing that happens in the year of Jubilee. That's what we're supposed to be thinking of. The year of Jubilee is a, a time when debts are forgiven, sins are forgiven, salvation comes. So, and it goes on then. Its interpretation is that the Lord will assign those freed to the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek. Do you want to become a follower of Melchizedek or a follower of Christ? Do you want to become a Christian? That is a possibility. You can do that. Once this occurs, there's some thing or event that occurs when this happens. When that happens, day of Pentecost, you can enter into the age of grace. And it's an, an amazing thing. Uh, and you will be freed. You're one of those captives under sin nature, but now the debt's been paid and you're going to be freed. So you're freed. You become a son of heaven. That means you become immortal. You, you were granted eternal life at this point. You're saved. And you're of the lot of Melchizedek or the lot of the Christians. Okay. Even those, now this is really interesting here, even those whose teachers had deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. So at this point, there's going to be a group of people who have been deceived by the uh, evil teachers, if you want to call them that, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that say, no, Melchizedek is, you know, the, the Messiah is just a guy. There's no virgin birth. There's no death. There's no atonement. He doesn't do that. He's just a general. 
Okay, that's changing the gospel. That's actually destroying it. If you believe that, you're not saved. You have to believe on Messiah. So these teachers deliberately hide the fact that they have salvation through the Melchizedekian priest. It's not through the blood of bulls and goats. Those are symbolic of what Messiah would do when he comes. Very, very important. So today, many Jews are beginning to realize, and I've been told many times by, by several different people, I'm not actually sure of all this stuff yet, but I know I've been lied to. Somebody is lying somewhere. This can't be true if the Talmud is also true. There's, there's, there's a problem somewhere. So, and people are becoming uh, believers in Messiah. We're going to see how this goes from further. This is not everything about Messiah. Okay, and it goes on and says, The Lord will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek, who will cause them to repent or return to the original covenant. The original covenant, covenant basically just says that you're a sinner, you can't save yourself. Messiah is going to come and do something and fix the problem. You don't have to do anything with it. You just wait on him and he's going to fix it. So just have faith in that. You know, and it's like many times in the New Testament, Paul quotes uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, the just live by faith. And we look at that and think faith in what, to who, I mean, be a little more specific, you know. And we go back and that's an exact quote out of chapter 2. But the commentary from the Dead Sea Scrolls makes it very clear the just are the only ones that are saved. That's how they're just. The just are saved by faith, and that is in what Messiah would do when he comes to pay the penalty for our sin. It's very, very clear in the text. And again, that's their interpretation. Don't know if that's correct or not. But as a Christian that believes the New Testament, they agree. So you can't say that they copied us. We learned our stuff from them. So it's very, very clear. So the Lord will do this. So the Lord will cast amid the portions of Melchizedek, their lot, make them repent or return, and proclaim freedom to them, okay? To free them from the debt of all their iniquities. So even though symbolically, I'm forgiven a money debt that I have. My bills are now just paid. So that's great. That's the only way you can do that symbolically. And we kill a cow and symbolically I've died in my sins and my sins are forgiven. So the, the money debt doesn't really do anything. The blood of bulls and goats doesn't really do anything. They both point to Messiah. So... He proclaims them and forgives them of the debt of their iniquities. They are now saved. That's amazing. Not bulls and goats, but simply by what Melchizedek, the Messiah, the Melchizedekian priest does. Now, we've mentioned this before, but I want you to look very careful at this, right, this one right here. This event, the event where Messiah, the Melchizedekian priest, somehow fixes everything, and reconciles us to God, forgiving the debt of our iniquities and making us to inter inherit eternal life, become the sons of heaven and um, uh, be amid the portions. So this event, now we know that to be the death on the cross, but this event, whatever it is, will take place the first week of the Jubilee that occurs after the ninth jubilee so again we have to go back to the calendar and i think we're going to talk about the calendar next week because we're getting ready to have the uh, summer solstice the uh, next tuesday not tomorrow but next tuesday is the uh tekufa nisan no tekufa tammuz i'm sorry summer solstice um uh for 2023 uh which is 5948 is that right i think i got it right Yes. So um, the way this works is you have uh, 14 unas in human history. An una is a 500-year a period. So in a 500-year period, you have 10 jubilees. Each jubilee is 50 years. 
so 500 years, 10 times 50. Each jubilee is made up of seven Shemitahs. A Shemitah is a seven-year period. Like we have 10 decades in a century, they have seven Shemitahs, seven seven-year periods in a jubilee. So it's 490, or 49 rather, years. And then there's a jubilee year, and then the process starts over again. So in a century, you'd have two jubilees. Two jubilees is 100 years, not 98, according to their calendar. And so you figure this out, and you can figure out easily the 500-year period we're in, going from Genesis forward. And then in that 500-year period, you can break it up into 10, and you can fairly easily, within a few years, figure out what year we are. So their time period ends, the, that period ends in 75 AD. So if we're talking about, we want to back up from the 10th Jubilee to the 9th Jubilee, that's 50 years short. So 75 AD minus 50 is 25 AD. And then it says, uh, this is the uh, first week of the Jubilee that comes after the 9th Jubilee. So we're in the 10th Jubilee, in other words. It's not finished. We're only one week or one Shemitah, one seven-year period into it. So the event where Messiah, the Melchizedekian priest, frees us from the debt of our iniquities occurs in 25 AD plus seven years. So 25 plus seven is 32. So we're being told here that the event occurs in 32 AD. Now, you could get that from looking at Daniel chapter 9, looking at the 70 weeks property. Uh, again, and another way of saying that is the 70 Shemitahs prophecy. But um, whether they got that from that or a different one or whatever, Daniel's is quite a bit more accurate down to the day. This is just saying it happens in a certain year. But it's an interesting thing. So, so far we've learned Melchizedek is God incarnate. He does an event that frees us from the debt of our iniquities. And the event occurs in 32 AD. Pretty interesting. So let's go on with this. It says, now the Day of Atonement is at the end of the 10th Jubilee. That would be 75 AD, you know. Okay, and so that is when atonement is made for all the sons of heaven, for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. And then we're missing a little piece. So there's going to be some day of vengeance when something happens, and it's all going to be over by the Jubilee period, which is in 75 AD. So when we look at this, we see Jesus was born in 2 BC, crucified in 32 AD. The church was born that same year, 32 AD. Then you have this time of a persecution repentance up to 70 AD when the destruction of the temple occurred. Then 73 AD, the shutdown of the Essene temple in, in Egypt. And then by 75, the actual end of the age, you have the Council of Yavne, when the rabbis decided no temple, you can't do sacrifices. So sacrifices no longer apply to a Jewish lifestyle. Now you just have to try to get along by doing good deeds. That's basically what the Talmud said at that point in the Mishnah. So it's interesting to see all these things. These things occurred. And there's many places in the, in the scrolls that talk about the teacher of righteousness, who is the only begotten, who is the one who was put to death by the evil priest who was called the liar. And this happened about 40 years before the temple was destroyed. And all those that followed the liar that were in the temple were destroyed or enslaved. So there's a lot of scriptures that are not scriptures, scrolls that talk about that. And that's exactly what we see in history, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, which is again, part of Daniel chapter nine, uh, Micah chapter five and several other prophecies. So this day of atonement in 75 D is when atonement, you know, punishment is made for the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek. It will be called, the, from that time forward, it will be called Mesa, Melchizedek's Day of Grace. Now, it's, there's also an Age of Grace. This is the Day of Grace we're talking about. Again, be real careful of that because sometimes 
they're almost identical, but to say a day or an age or a year, it, it may have a slight different meaning to it. It might even be talking about the exact same year, but the meaning is different. The repentance or persecution or something. So anyway, he will in his strength rise up or raise up the holy ones of God to execute judgment as it has been written concerning him in the Psalms of David. So the Christians will arise, the Romans will put the evil people to death, and this is going to fulfill some of the messianic Psalms that David wrote about. So then they quote Psalm 82, Elohim stands in the divine assembly in the midst of the Elohim he judges. And he says, above it to the heights return, and God will judge the nations. And in another place, back in Psalm 82, how long will you judge unjustly and show impartiality to the wicked? Selah. And of course, when you see Selah in there, that's actually a breath note, meaning if you're singing it, you're going to say it a certain way. But it also means a riddle. So if you're just reading this, this particular thing is a riddle of something. It's a prophecy. So in other words, this is talking about the unjust people that rejected Messiah, that stayed in the temple, and they were destroyed. When Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, he wrote it specifically to the Jewish priests. Basically saying, I can understand if you wanted to be a Pharisee and a scene, a scribe, whatever. I can see you thinking about it, trying to figure it out. But once the event occurs and Messiah comes and he heals people and he dies and he resurrects and you see that with your own eyes, then you know the Sadducee idea and the Essene idea and the scribe idea is not quite exactly what happened. The one that fits is the Essene idea. And if the prophecies have all been fulfilled as dictated by the testaments of the patriarchs and the Old Testament, then if those are done, the rest of them are going to be done, which is a destruction of the temple and dispersion of Israel at the end of the age. So you have seen with your own eyes, you've tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers in the, the age to come, and you have went back to doing sacrifices. And if you don't make a decision very quickly, specifically in the next 15 years, from when Paul wrote Hebrews to 75. If you don't make a decision very quickly, and probably in the next 10 years, you're going to be trapped, and you're either going to be dead or enslaved. Your whole family can be slaughtered. It's coming. That the prophecies are specific. Make sure you follow directions. I was reading uh, Eusebius a week or so back, and he was talking about not the destruction of the temple. I haven't really gotten there yet, but 68 AD, a couple of years before, uh, the believers in Messiah were told by prophets that they were to pick up and move to Pella. And he says that they did. They picked up and they moved to Pella. It took a little bit of time. No hurry per se, but don't just set. Just as quickly as you can pick up and move to Pella. And he says, as soon as they were all moved, everybody went, all the believers went, because you follow what the prophets say. So all the believers went. And he said, at that point, you couldn't find a single Christian, a single believer in Jerusalem or probably anywhere in Judea. It's like, like they never existed. They were just gone, man. They left. And very quickly after the last of them left is 68 AD when the, when the Romans descended to crush the rebellion. They besieged all the major cities and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. And then he said, and he describes some of the gross stuff. And then he says, after that, it got really bad. And so he begins to describe the besiegement of the temple and those things. But it was interesting to me. It's like the Lord said, this is the time of repentance. Stay here and witness. Okay, time's over. Move. We can see that with um, the 120 years of Methuselah and Noah witnessing to people. And at a certain point, they said, God says, I'm done. Build a boat. 
and you know it's not going to happen until you get the boat finished but don't dilly dally either but you don't have to worry just get it done get in the boat and stuff will happen so same kind of thing going here so the interpretation of these psalms by david is that belial and the spirits of his lot the people that followed the liar that rejected messiah who turn away from the commandments of god and wickedness melchizedek will enact vengeance of the vengeances of the judgments of god and we have all that in history so interesting after this happens there's no more jewish persecution sanhedrin persecution of messianic believers because the nation is gone right it says this is the day of peace this starts the day of peace there's messianic believers and they spread throughout the earth and you have christian kingdoms and empires that form in time but this begins the day of peace about which god spoke through the prophet isaiah when he said how beautiful are the mountains are the feet of the messenger who proclaims peace the messenger of good who proclaims salvation saying to zion your god reigns now the interpretation of this passage they say is that the mountains are the prophet's predictions if you go to a church where they say prophecy is confusing prophecy is divisive we won't worry about it we'll just go do the other stuff please leave that church i mean try to help them to understand but the scrolls are very specific to ignore prophecy is just as bad as focusing on prophecy but ignoring morality you wouldn't go to a church where the pastor gives communion every sunday and gets drunk or certain deacons are running around after some of the girls or somebody's always stealing something out of the tithe you wouldn't go to a church like that why why would anybody but if we it might be completely moral but if you're not paying attention to prophecy according to some of the scrolls that's an equally bad sin it's important that you know what god did what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future to ignore it can amount to calling god a liar which is blasphemy according to this the manuscripts so i'm just just saying so we need to pay attention to this the interpretation then is the mountains are the prophets predictions all those messianic prophecies about messiah the predictions specifically about the messenger in this piece the messenger is the one anointed of the spirit or mashiach of the spirit uh messiah in other words this is the messiah uh, of the spirit about whom daniel said and then he quotes a, a chapter 9 of uh, daniel until messiah the prince comes there shall be seven weeks that's part of that 70 week prophecy he the messiah that comes is the messenger of good who proclaims salvation he is the one to whom it is written where it says to comfort those who are mourn back to isaiah 61 again jesus read that in the synagogue at nazareth to comfort those who mourn closes it up and said that's me today in your hearing this is fulfilled very interesting so the same passages jesus is quoting in the new testament are the same ones they expected messiah to come and fulfill and quote so very very interesting um he is the one to whom it is written you know in isaiah to comfort those who are mourn and to instruct them in all the periods of the ages in truth so it is very important for us and apparently messiah somewhere instructed us about the calendar and if we understand the calendar we will understand prophecy much much better not just prophecy but everything really uh, when they say it was a certain day of the week three days later they went and did something you'll instantly know what they were doing you'll, you'll understand everything better but prophecy is i think where most of our hearts are at so going on with this zion is those who uphold the covenant who do who turn aside from walking in the ways of the people and where it says your god 
Let me go up and just look at that again. The passage is, how beautiful are the mountains of the feet of the messenger who proclaims peace. How beautiful it is to see Jesus' feet. Uh, the messenger of good who proclaims salvation, saying to Zion, those that are messianic, your God reigns. So Zion is the believers in the prophecies, and your God in that passage actually is literally Melchizedek, the Melchizedekian priest that came to pay the penalty for your iniquities in 32 AD. Very interesting. And he will save them from the hand of Belial if you accept God's salvation. As for where it's said, and this is where it changes a little bit. So that's one section. Now we're going to talk about a different set of prophecies. As for where it said, you will blow the signal horn in the seventh month. That's a quote out of Leviticus. It has to do with the divisions of the times. Now, when we understand Passover points to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, Pentecost to the new birth, when we get to the Rosh Hashanah or Yom Torah, the day of awakening blast, it's when the resurrection rapture occurs. So now we're getting ready to talk about the resurrection rapture, the events that come in around the second coming. Okay. And that's where the manuscript is ripped off. But it's beginning to talk to us about the rapture and the second coming. As far as that prophecy, what it means is something about the divisions of the times or the divisions of the ages, which we know that. Now, the only other thing here is in column three, there's a few little pieces to this, and it's too little to really make even a sentence out of. Something about 200 something, something about a week, like a seven-year period of something, something to do with the rapture resurrection in a seven-year period. It has to do with the division of times. It is an appointed time, so it's a fulfillment of a prophecy. And something happens at the end of a jubilee. Now we have the calendars. We know when the end of the jubilees are. Um, the next to the last jubilee of the Age of Grace is March of 2025 to March of 2026. The very last jubilee of this age is 50 years later. That doesn't mean that the second coming has to be all the way up 52 years from now. But everything is finished before the end of that jubilee or in this case whatever they're talking about something occurs something major something about melchizedek 200 something a shemitah seven seven year period at appointed time and something about melchizedek himself will carry it with his own hands carry something so this that could be talking about a lot of things actually but apparently if melchizedek is messiah he came and went Apparently, Melchizedek is back doing something with his own hands at the end of the Jubilee, the division of times, something around the time of that appointed time, which is a seven year a week, a Shemitah. So we all know a little bit about the tribulation period, and obviously this is beginning to talk about it. And there's something about a signal horn, a resurrection rapture, a seven year period. Very interesting. And like I say, that's all we have of this. And I love the first part for witnessing purposes. I really wish I had a complete column three. I'd probably say things I'm not supposed to. Who knows? It would be interesting. Apparently, they knew stuff. Just saying that. And then I just in here, this is actually from the Damascus Covenant, the latest book that we wrote well, last, last fall. But basically... It's one of the clearest scrolls on the Essene teaching about Messiah. There's actually, like I said, another 10, 11 of them that are clear about Messiah being God incarnate. And there's several about him being the only begotten and things like that. So the Messiah is a Melchizedekian priest who saves us from our sin nature. He's God incarnate. We're saved by an event that occurs one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of their age, which is the eighth Anna. Uh, eighth on of the age of Torah, on their calendar, the, our, our calendar comes out to be 32 AD. After our salvation, after that event, begins something called the age of grace. 
and the day of vengeance and things like that. Uh, the end is fragmented, but it looks like the age of grace ends by the blowing of a trumpet and some major event occurring. So anyway, like I said, this is an amazing text. And this one, 11Q13, uh, again, part of the 11th cave. I'm interested to see what's going to be uh, found in the 12th cave. Um, one manuscript out of 900. Now, most of them are copies of scripture. A lot of them are highly fragmented. A good good percentage of them are calendar stuff, how to, how to do a calendar. So that's good. But then you have these kind of things. There's probably a good 20 or 30 of these kind of things that are coherent enough and big enough for us to get some interesting information. Now, if you're a Christian, believer in the New Testament, none of this really is new information you would have put two and two together because it's pretty clear in the New Testament. If you're not a Christian and you're a faithful Jew, you need to understand that your ancestors said stuff like this. And you can read Hebrew, most likely. So go back and grab the manuscripts and just read it. Make sure I haven't mistranslated it or anything. You can go to the Dead Sea Scroll archives, anywhere, pick it up, just read it. So I encourage you to do that. And then if you understand that this is exactly what your ancestors said, just pick up a Hebrew copy of a New Testament and read it and see what you think and keep studying. And then if you think there's something to it, find a Messianic synagogue and just go talk to people. Um, it's very, very important. Messiah loves you. And even though you have been lied to by somebody, according to this text, you still have salvation. You can still accept the Messiah and be saved and be a part of, part of the lot of Melchizedek. Very, very important for you to do.